Welcome back to the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. This is a news episode. We talk about book releases, playbook releases, Hellraiser, and Rawhead Rex news. We also get caught up on some feedback from listeners and our plans for the rest of the year and Texas Frightmare Weekend. Uh, this week, Jose had a sudden work conflict, so he couldn't make it, but you still have Rob, David, and me. I'm Ryan. This episode is brought to you by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination Shop, which is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of the proceeds from his art uh, will support the program where artist Don Bertram volunteers monthly. Please join us in donating to the program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's a link in the show notes and on the main website at clivebarkercast.com that will take you where you need to go to get one of his prints or art books and help out this wonderful program. Thank you, Don Bertram, for your support. Well, welcome to episode 168. Um, I'm Ryan. I'm uh, Rob. And I'm Dave. All right. So this is a news episode. And um, I guess, to, well, to start out with, there um, there have been some re-releases of books. Um, SST Publications uh, is doing the UK edition of uh, uh, of uh, Hellraiser: The Toll, um, and actually, I I like that cover better. Uh, did you? Have, yeah. have you guys seen that one? Yeah, yeah I like it. Looks it. Really so, nice. Uh, that Daniel Sarah. Yeah, um, yeah that's a really cover. nice cover. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm hoping that someday, if we ever get a, a Candyman Blu-ray, that they're going to use his Candyman artwork that he posted. Oh, that oh yeah. Great. Yeah, that was a great with him with Candyman and uh, Helen, right? Yep. Uh huh. Yeah, that was a great picture. Yeah. I, I just love his style of artwork. Yeah, he right. did a lot of the work for the Hellraiser anthology. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they ever do Candyman again. Um, if they if they'll just do a box set with all three. Yeah, they should. <laughs> they they re- well and honestly nobody wants to buy Candyman three separately anyway, right? I mean that yeah that movie is terrible. <laughs> But the first yeah. two, the first two are really good. Yeah, it's kind of like with uh, when Vestron released Wishmaster and uh, Warlock. Like nobody wants the sequels, but you lump <laughs> them all in together, so you get them all anyways. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That was one. I, I mean, I ended up getting the uh, Wishmaster and Warlock. Uh, both of those. That's not one one of the reasons that kind of made me not want to get them was. <laughs> that they had the sequel and, you know, <laughs> attached to them, but I got them anyway because they were on sale. Yeah. So I got I called them on a really good sale because I've never I've, the only Wishmaster I really watch is the first one, uh, and I don't you know I've yeah. not that's I'm never gonna watch the sequels really. <laughs> I guess the the second one's I guess it's fairly decent. I guess yeah. I mean, it's got some fun parts. So it's got yeah. still got Andrew <laughs> Divoff in the role, but I've never seen three or four, so I can't comment. Yeah. But Warlock, uh, uh. I just got it, got it for the first one, and I, I don't think I've ever seen the second or third ones of yeah. those. I know I haven't. I I think the first Warlock is funny though at the end when she injects him with her her syringe. <laughs> and yeah. She, and she says, "Oh, like what's insulin gonna do to me?" And she goes, "Try salt water, asshole." And it's like he doesn't <laughs> he doesn't die or explode until he realizes that he got injected with salt water. It's it's kind of like when the cartoon characters run over the cliff, they don't fall until they look yeah. down. <laughs> yeah, I think they should have had an alternate ending where he's just living his life, you know, and a few <laughs> years later they bump into each other. She goes, you remember that time when I injected you with that needle? He's like, yes. <laughs> well, that was salt water. And he's like, no! <laughs> well, that's funny. Um. Oh, and then the other one uh, is Tonight Again. Um, yeah, which which also has a great looking cover. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bad. I don't know. It's kind of <laughs> it's kind of cheesy to me. It kind of has a cheesy romantic. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't know. I mean, it's okay. I guess I just it's not as good as like I agree with you. I like the sketch uh, Clive did for the original cover. Better. Yeah, but this looks like uh, Sex from Hell because you get <laughs> yeah, the thread uh, of the chains going does. underneath it. And... <laughs> oh, I just know. I just saw the bed. I didn't notice that it had chains underneath. Yeah, it's chains yeah. coming up. Yeah, I should have. Uh, <laughs> looked a little closer but yeah the 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 one really cool thing about this t- sst version of tonight again is it doesn't seem to be um uh it doesn't seem to be a limited release is from what i can tell yeah 
So this is a way for people that missed out on it the first time, they can still get it. And I think I think that's available now. Unless yes, it is. Hellraiser the Toll, I think they're saying like um, in March. It's not available for, yeah, it's not it's available just, for it just pre-order spring, yet. spring, I think, spring 2018. Yeah. The UK always seems to get the better covers, don't they? The Scarlet <laughs> Gospels was a better cover. Oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't mind the cover for the, the one for the U.S. It was it was good, too. Yeah. Well, it's not as, it's Speaking not as of this. UK covers, I guess we can kind of skip ahead to this Rawhead Rex release by Arrow. So I yeah. think this is one case where the UK did not get a better cover. I think the the Kino Lorber uh, cover for for the Rawhead Rex Blu-ray is way better than this Arrow release one that they're. Have you guys seen yeah. what that looks yeah. like? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I mean, with the Rawhead Rex one that we got here from Kino, it's got Sean Phillips artwork on there, and he's just one of the best you know comic book artists in the industry. Yeah. But this one, I still really dig because yeah. it kind of adds like a uh, like a pulpy sense to the film. I uh, got you. I agree with you with on that. Kind of like an old EC comic book, you know? Yeah, yeah, kind of definitely. Vibe, you know? it, it reminds me of one of those uh, movies that you would see in a video store and you go, huh, I wonder why they painted the cover of this instead of showing something from the actual movie. And you get yeah. suspicious. Like the Exterminators. <laughs> or Remember that one with the guy with oh, the, yeah. the tank treads for legs? and, and um, didn't, didn't show up in the movie at all, though. Yeah, I mean, or like yeah, the... Q, the... the the and winged serpent. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's Those got like some... that 80s metal vibe to yeah. it. Yeah, that exactly. you find on like a discount cassette <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Or was it like the Barbarian Queen or whatever? Stuff like that, you yeah. know? And they it was did, like, they it looked didn't... like Conan, you know? Conan the Barbarian kind of paintings. Yeah. Yeah. And like but, but either Rosetta. Up to the, to the painting they have on the box. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, like, either route you go with, both versions make Rawhead Rex look so much more awesome than he is in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Far more fierce and intense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That suit needed some more uh, slime on it. This looked too clean. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's, so it's, it's put... weird. He's got ripped up clothes. I mean, who made his clothes? Where did he live where they were making him boots and stuff? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the story doesn't have any clothes. He's just this big, you know, yeah. all phallic symbol kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's pretty much the only thing that they, you get come with this is it's the same uh, special features, but you're getting they get they come with like a uh a, a, a collector's booklet. Mm-hmm. Featuring writing on the film by Cat uh, Angler. No, that's something. Ellen, I think that's Ellinger. Mentioned. Ellinger. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. We Ellinger. we get that in the Kino Lorber version oh, as well. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. It's so it's it's really stuff. the same packaging. Yeah, just different art. And it's just a region too. Yeah. And it does have a reversible sleeve featuring original newly commissioned artwork by Wes. So. Yeah. Was that was that who did this? Uh, the cover is just the. Wes, uh, I'm confused on it because it says it does say there's reversible oh. sleep original gotcha. and newly commanded short, so I don't know. Oh, yeah, I wonder what's on the other side. Yeah, I would Something imagine more. like the uh, I think the Kino Lorber one had the old school, um, oh, VHS yeah, it's, cover. it's got the old VHS cover on yeah, it. Yeah, that maroon yeah. like church with raw heads, silver. raw head, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so probably. it's good to see that they're getting a UK release. Yeah, yeah, Fans this is a really, be... really good edition. I still haven't watched it yet, but um, yeah, it's, it's it's a great transfer. Like, I mean, it's it's so good for such a rough movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. I wonder if they'll do. Uh, since this is, I think it's sold pretty well. I wonder if they'll do try to do uh, transmutations. Yeah, oh, that know. would be nice. And David, one guy in the comments gave you a hard time. He wrote like. He wrote like UK only, LOL. They ship anywhere in the world. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is true, but it's in, intentional to be UK only. <laughs> yes, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's it's region locked, so you still yeah. have to be able to play it if you ship it to. You know, yeah, the I mean, like North America. And pretty much every uh, every fan of cinema nowadays has a region free player because you can get it for like a hundred dollars on Amazon. But yeah. it's just whether you want to order the stuff from overseas or not because that's what their intent to sell is. So. Well, that was a huge bone of contention for people in Occupy Midian. Just a few people, but, you know, when somebody would suggest, why don't you get a region-free f- player, they're like, we shouldn't have to. I know, that was <laughs> the big argument. Yeah. I, actually yeah. broke down and, I actually broke down and actually got a region-free player because there's a lot of movies that they just don't release, haven't released here in the U.S. I think yeah. you, you that are overseas that for the, for the, um, the Hellraiser Scarlet Box, yeah. right? Yeah, I did yeah. that for the Scarlet Box, yeah. Yeah, I did Which, the same thing, yeah. too. Which it was, was only it was only a hundred dollars, and uh, you know, yeah. and when I got that, I started buying movies that you know they haven't released over here yet. So, yeah. I mean, know, it was worth, I think it's worth into, it. If you're into Giallo films, I mean, the UK yeah. is pressing way more than any U.S. company, even Arrow's U.S. market. You know, I mean, I've got a bunch of the Arrow. Uh, the Dara Argento stuff through other yeah. region based arrows. Uh, so. Yeah, and it, like Shameless, and there's a whole bunch of 88 films. Like they yeah, all 88 press films. some really cool stuff that just they haven't gotten the rights to here in the States yet. What does Giallo mean? Uh, uh, Giallo, it's a style of uh, slasher. Italian, Italian horror film. Yeah, based on like the old uh, yellow paperback, kind of like crime thriller mysteries. Yeah. So, like a and, lot uh, of Dara Argento, Dara Argento. Films are very inspired by. So yeah, is Mario Bob. Is it a lot yeah, of Mario like ang- of of camera angles from the point of view of the killer, like breathing yeah, heavy? Yeah, 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 exactly. With, the, with okay. the black leather gloves, you know exactly. that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, there's like a lot of red herrings throughout the movie, yeah. trying to get you to stay, you know, off your feet. Very Hitchcockian. Yeah. Huh. Well, in other news, um, Phil and Sarah Stokes replied to us on Twitter because so they I, I keep forgetting that they listen to us sometimes. So, so this was <laughs> cool. Uh, they said, in answer to your question, guys, yes, we will be publishing all of Clive's surviving plays just as fast as we can transcribe, edit, and design them. So that was on Twitter. They said that, which was nice. It's it's also really cool that we're going to be getting all of the plays. Nice. So that whole list and uh, the that was in the back of the magician. They're doing all those. Yeah, yeah. So wow, that's, that's a great. lot. I need to update the release list on the side of the website too to include the Hunters in the Snow and Colossus. I think or no, Crazy Face, right? Or the yeah, Crazy thing. Face. Yeah. They're doing a you know a bunch of stuff. They've got you know that you know they're doing and they're doing the Imaginer books and are they, have they are they going to continue? Uh, I recently got the third. Yeah, of, uh, oh, memory prophecy. Memory prophecy. Are they aren't they going to do more of those too? I I imagine they probably are. I mean, um, if you're li- mm. if you guys are listening out there, you can answer this too. But I think, you know, it's a lot to do. So, and and I haven't even read number three <laughs> yet. So I'm okay if it takes them a little while because I'm having trouble keeping up. They uh, have a. Uh, I got the third book. It was on sale. So uh, there's a good sale on that uh, third uh, book of called Ma- you know called Masquerades. Oh really? Uh, actually, there's yeah, there's not many left though. I think I got I'm getting down to the wire on that one. Oh wow! I looked at the the number on that one. And there's only 250 they make, right? I think Beach. so. Yeah. Yeah. I think mine was like 228. Whoa! Ooh. And that's so number three. Getting... I wonder if they've sold out of the first two. No, the second because. Um, I bought the se- I bought the second one the other day, so it should be it's on the way. Okay. Yeah, and I've thought about doing an episode on those, but it takes me a long time to read. They're so dense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got. I've not. I've not started reading any of them. Yeah. I just want to have it for you know f- the future. Want to yeah. sit down to read something. Yeah, and I read the first two, but it was when they first came out, so it was a long time ago. I'd have to go back and reread if we were going to talk about them on the podcast. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, there's they're really in depth kind of encyclopedia. Really of nice life. picture, a lot of nice pictures too. Uh, mm-hmm. Masquerade has a lot of good stuff on. Uh, uh, my favorite play that I liked uh, personally about Clive's written is uh, Frankenstein. I love it seems to go into that one a lot. Yeah, well, and if anyone is curious about how in depth these books are, just imagine three encyclopedia-sized books 
that only get up to his life before the Books of Blood, like before he actually took <laughs> off and became famous. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just an amazing amount of detail. Yeah. So the um, the Sylvia Jen and Sylvia Soska started a, a blood drive women in horror thing to promote women in horror and also to promote uh, talking people into donating blood. I think mm-hmm. also yep. to bring awareness and promote equality throughout the horror industry. Mm-hmm. Something they've been doing for the past few years, I believe. Yeah, I think this is the ninth year of it, right? Yeah. Wow. Well, and there are, um, so some people we know have done videos. So there's one with Mark Miller, and um, I guess we can say his, he really hates it when people say his name for some reason. But, <laughs> but the, the Christian, uh, the main actor in, in, the, in the, uh, the Coming Dawn ministry, so it was mm-hmm. uh, directed by, and by Mark Miller, um, uh, the, the, who runs... Clive Barker's Seraphim, and uh, and then Christian Francis, who you know formerly worked at uh, worked for for Seraphim. He actually uh, co-wrote it and stars as the yeah the preacher in the yes. the short piece. And yeah. that, that one's pretty disturbing. It's uh, it's like a cable access preacher yelling at you, and he yeah, as he goes along, he gets more and more incoherent and and scary. Kind of reminds me of like the old like. Uh, Jimmy Swaggered or something like yes. that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God, like that. When when I was a teenager, I used to call those... Um, you, it seemed like on, on regular television, at, in, in weird off hours, there would be these um, televangelists would go on the air and just talk and have phone mm-hmm. numbers that you could call. <laughs> so, you so call I used, them? Yeah, yeah, I would call them. <laughs> I, I, I called oh, one lady and I said, if Adam and Eve had children and then their children had children wouldn't they have uh wouldn't they be have birth defects from um what was it oh from from being inbred (laughs) (laughs) oh that's awesome (laughs) and 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 the lady goes times were different back then i have to go and she hung up on me (laughs) (laughs) oh that's great you trolled them yes (laughs) But um, but yeah, and it was um, it, it, this was a funny one because it was kind of, and it had this cable access quality, which is it's actually really hard to put like TV static into a video if you've ever tried to do that lately. VCR, even like the most current VCRs, when you get static on your TV, it turns blue. Yeah. So you can't, really, it's really I don't know. It's it's different. Have you tried to do it or have you? been testing things like that and noticed yeah it. yeah when i sometimes when i've made videos i've wanted to put static in something um like to yeah. show to show um like changing a, cha- a channel on a tv show or something on a tv or something like that and and it's hard oh weird yeah and this has a pretty consistent uh like rolling warp throughout the whole tape <laughs> yeah. as it plays yeah yeah I wonder if they got an old VHS tape or something to do that. Yeah, it almost seems like it, doesn't it? <clears throat> but then, yeah, Paul. but then if you do that and then you digitize it, it screws the static really screws with digitizer, you know, with digitizing VHS footage, and it just it skips things. Oh. Uh. Because I've tried, I've also been trying to uh, import like all these old movies that I made in like high school and college, and it's really frustrating because you think you can just walk away and let it record, and then you come back and you find out a bunch of stuff got left out. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. But but um, anyways, I, this uh, this short has a really nice uh, climactic end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that follows the theme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get right with the Lord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of cool to hear a British guy do a, a southern accent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he did a good job. I really yeah. liked his performance. Yeah. And um, then uh, also Nicholas Vince. Uh, you just posted that before we started recording. But yes. Yeah. Nicholas Vince. He, uh, that, was, he, that was pretty he, funny. <laughs> he had just put that up like just like a few minutes before we started recording. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, but that was a. Uh, I like the the visual style of that one. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I, well, and I was looking in the credits because I thought, did someone, are those still pictures that they that they uh, ran a filter through to make them look like comics, or did mm-hmm. someone paint those? Honestly, I yeah. don't know how they. It, it looks like a filter over uh, like Barbies or something. Yeah, like, you're right. It look they look like a. What was that movie that uh, the South Park guys did? The South Park guys made a movie. It was kind of like they used oh, fake Team America. Yeah, oh, they made. Yeah. It's what, it, it, these like these look like Barbie dolls, but they use like uh, you're like you're right, like a, a filter over them yeah. to make them look like. Yeah, yeah that it, created, be... it kind of created this odd kind of movement to it all. And yeah. it's, it a, strange, it's a lot of work. That, then they had to set up like a bar and a and a and their and the home sets. Yeah, know, for these with with the uh, Martin poster in the background. <laughs> yeah, Nosferatu. Yeah, that, I mean, that kind of yeah. tips you off to what it's really about. The Nosferatu kind yeah. of yeah. visual. Yeah visual symbolism there but yeah. speaking of ec comics earlier this definitely feels in that vein or like yeah. tales from the dark side that kind of stuff yeah 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 it's kind of neat they, they they the comic book style sort of editing that they did too plus that uh the the ending that like you said kind of gets tipped away from the uh, background but you kind of know that it's going there but still when it happens it's kind of like yeah that that's cool that reminds me of tales <laughs> from the crypt yeah <laughs> yeah it does yeah, that was cool. So good, good work, Nicholas Vince, and we'll have yes. links to Very both nice. of those in the in the show notes. And oh, and this one is just we'll just mention really briefly. Um, but there were uh, there were copies of the Cabal Cut on a website called Horror Marketplace, uh, run by the person who used to run uh, Clive Barker's Clive Barker's uh, real Clive Barker store. Um, and they're already the whole, gone. Yeah, the horror market is it gone now? The whole, I mean, the yeah. the cabal cuts are the, definitely sold out. Yeah, but I think well, the horror marketplace is going to go down if it hasn't already. No, it's still up. I'm, okay. I've got the page pulled up, so oh, yeah. it's going to go down now. Yeah, he told us because we, we we were talking about you know working with him a little more, but um, but I think that uh, that's the, that website's going to go down. Okay. And. Um, Oh, and this is, I think, largely thanks to you, Rob, but uh, Gary Tunnicliffe listened to our audio commentary and uh, and he commented on it, which was really cool for yeah. for, um, for Hellraiser Judgment. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you know, he did the interview that uh, I also had an interview I did with him. Oh, He's yeah. an, I, really, I really like Gary. He's a really nice kind of down-to-earth guy but i've got to just not talk to him you know through emails and stuff like yeah. that yeah and, and it was but he really liked he really liked the commentary he had good things to say about it he even made him kind of chuckle <laughs> <laughs> made him laugh a, a few times so he had a good you know definitely good sense of humor about it yeah and he's was, you know cool and he took you know he seems like he's really aware of the you know the limitations because due to the budget yeah that and he's got to be pretty proud because uh i mean the the response back from the community seems to be the majority seems to be pretty positive. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. There are some people that get really angry and, you know, so oh, yeah. if anybody yeah. likes it, they must be a, they must be a, they're, like a, they're like, blind. They're blind. Love. Yeah. They're just blind. <laughs> Fanboy right. boy like, blinders. I hate, I hate that. I've always yeah. hated that kind of, you know, yeah. you know, saying uh, if you, if you hate a movie, fine, you know, that's great. Yeah. But don't tell yeah. people if they, they, you know, enjoy a film. They've enjoyed it for their own merits. Yeah. I've watched Hellraiser Judgment ten times. I don't think I'd watch a movie blindly yeah. ten times. That, yeah. you know? I mean, every person has a terrible movie that they all really enjoy, whether they <laughs> yeah. want to admit it or not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in Hellraiser Judgment, I mean, everybody. I think anybody can agree that it's flawed, and I mean, I think in, in most oh, part, yeah, the most part yeah. because of the the budget, you know, the budget mm-hmm. constraints. And then Gary Tunnicliffe would also say it's also um, he also was kind of his original script was kind of censored down. Um, yeah. But we don't we don't really know what the, those differences are exactly. But um, unless he wants to give us a copy of the original script, to read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. I would be really interested to see what the what the differences were yeah. in the original. Yeah, I think that 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 it was a real challenge to do all the human parts, especially. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the, the, the storyline with the serial killer that when it gets to that, it just kind of, I put it in my review. There's no really atmosphere to the, yeah. to all of that. It kind of like, you know, with the lack of budget, it really just, I don't know. There's just, 
I wasn't, there's no on the edge of your seat, like, Oh, what's it, what's this guy going to do next? You know, it's just, yeah. you know, there just isn't anything that, uh, made me feel kind of emotionally connected to that, but yeah, it all just kind of happens. Yeah. But, uh, what I really enjoyed about the movie was the, the, well, I call them this. Well, J- Gary calls them the Stygian, Stygian Inquisition yeah. group. You know that, you know, with the auditor and you know the yeah. assessor, the the, the jury, the jury, the jury, and all the all those yeah. other characters. And and I liked all the the Hellraiser elements, and that's why I was watching the movie really. And uh, I mean, that's that's the only reason we really watch these movies, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I think the movie's more of a Hellraiser movie than people give it credit for. I think, you know, yeah. I think it there, – Hellraiser originally is a – a lot of – Hellraiser has this kind of, you know, story with a story underneath it yeah. that's a lot bigger and mysterious. And I think Judgment kind of went back to that in a way. Yeah. There are you also know. people out there that are saying, it's oh, it's just adapted from his, his Judgment short film that he was trying to make for Kickstarter. And it's like – yeah, but that was adapted from a Hellraiser script. Yeah. You know, See, if you, there's a, some interviews that uh, Gary's done with this. Uh, actually, made a news report on a blog on the blog uh, that he's done with this uh, YouTube. Uh, I guess uh, uh, you know uh, blog site guys. They do interviews with filmmakers, and but uh, it's called the Midnight Midnight's Edge. Have y'all have happened to have a chance to listen to any of those interviews uh-uh. of? No, I haven't. And he kind of goes into that. Well, you know, uh, there's a three-part interview. The first part's about his history with Hellraiser films and a lot of inter- interesting stuff with that. And then the second part was more about revelations of what happened there, why it turned out the way it did, and start the start of his um, falling out with you know Doug Bradley, where how that began. Yeah. Then the third part they've done is how. Ju- with judgment, how it started out. He had written judgment as a he because he writes. I guess he must write Hellraiser stories just on the side, just to in case you know movies are going to be made. He kind of you know is always pitching them to Dimension, and he had written judgments uh, as a you know another Hellraiser story. And you know people he showed it to some people and they were like, oh, we really like this. And but. Some of his friends, like Stephen Norton, you know, the director of Blade, were like, "Why don't you take these Hellraiser elements and just try to do a Kickstarter, make it your own thing?" Mm-hmm. And you know, y'all, I'm sure y'all know about that. He tried to do it and it just it failed, so it yeah. didn't go anywhere. But when uh, the rights were again looming for Dimension to keep the franchise rights again for Hellraiser, you know, that the pretty one of the producers called him and said, "Do you have any, you know?" you know ideas for a sequel we could make and he was like absolutely and they gave him you know he gave him judgment and it seemed to that's what they you know decided to make there's actually a lot of interesting info if you go and uh listen to him and talk about all this stuff it, it's very interesting i actually feel bad for him about how him and doug have like had a the yeah. falling out between them it's yeah. really kind of yeah. sad I hope yeah. they can figure 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 things out to work things out in the future because it doesn't really seem worth it to me to lose a fr- fr- you know the, the long friendship they developed yeah. over some you know just silly politics and I think Gary even is yeah he you know is is like that he doesn't understand why this is got to be this way well and mm-hmm. I and I think that it probably in Doug's defense would have been worth the risk to just say, yeah, fine. You can just have the script. You don't have to sign this NDA. I mean, it's, it was like a 200, $300,000 movie. Right. I mean, they could have just yeah. given it to him. Yeah. Yeah. And one guy even says that during the interview, he brings that up, you know, mm-hmm. brings that up about, you know, uh, so in, in those interviews, does he say, you know, where, uh, judgment kind of fell in line when he's writing it compared to Revelation. Like, has he did he write these, you know, like a while ago and he's just been hanging on to them, or uh, did these kind of wrote, evolve over time? He, he wrote uh, uh, Judgment after Revelations. Because you know Judgment, because Revelations was a similar thing where they came up with, like, you know, we got, there's, you know, the producer, the same producer, his name is Joel. So Sashin or something like that. I mean, he's, mm-hmm. works with Dimension, 
And uh, it was like, you know, we got to make a Hellraiser movie real quick. We got to get the rights, keep our eyes because we want to do this remake. Well, and I didn't Gary uh, adapt Revelations from a, a from a reboot script that he had already written. No, that's not what I got from it at okay. all. He had just re- he wrote this over a weekend in a hotel room in Michigan, and uh, he really, uh, but basically, uh, just I'd, I'd go. I'd go listen to those uh, interviews. I'd highly recommend listening to them. Mm, yeah. But to answer that uh, question, he wrote Judgment after uh, after the Revelations of something. Yeah, he wrote. He'd written another one too. He's not. He'd written another one. He pitched to him as well. Well, and I think because it's, of Revelations, people were a lot of people were predisposed to hate Judgment. You know, before mm-hmm. they before they even saw it. Yeah, but yes. he's already spoken. He was. He's already been pretty vocal about what happened with the changes to the script while they were shooting it and all that. Yeah, kind he of goes stuff, into so. that. Yeah, he goes into a lot of that. And uh, but uh, another interesting thing he talked about was like on Hellraiser Bloodline that you know, like everybody, you know, I've always assumed that Kevin Yeager was kind of like you know the one that. Uh, kind of fell victim to the studio politics and he makes it sound like uh, Kevin Yeager had a bigger part in that film's uh, failure really oh, wow. which I found to be, be very interesting I didn't know that so that's on the very first part of the interviews huh. I don't know I mean if this is I mean, if you can keep this off the record okay I mean well he put well no it doesn't matter because it's out there but he, the, Kevin Yeager was kind of a like you know he'd made some mistakes with a uh, you know, choosing the wrong kind of DP oh. and uh, for the movie and the design for the movie was all wrong. And huh. that, you know, he didn't want to admit that he'd made a mistake and work with Dimension to try to make a better movie. And he kind of shut him out from uh, the editing process. Because I think as a, I guess when there's all these, being a, you know, right, a director's guild part member, you have certain rights, I guess. He kept him out of the editing of the he kept up the producers or Bob wives, Bob Weinstein out of the editing for like 12 weeks. Oh, and wow. it was like, you know, Jeez. you know what I mean? Bob Weinstein didn't like that. That really, you know, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, cause it just, that's, it's just that you need to go, go listen to that stuff. It's very, it's wow. very fascinating. That's, that's interesting. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that, if that's true, that's pretty gutsy for a, a, a new director, you know, to be doing that stuff. Well, apparently, uh, uh, Kevin has a, a big, from what, you know, Gary says, I mean, I don't know Kevin personally, so, I mean, this is just from what he says, mm-hmm. that Kevin has kind of has a big head on his oh. big head because, you know, he became a pretty popular, you know, makeup effects guy, you know, at a young age, and he's a multimillionaire, you know, he's very confident, and huh. he thinks maybe, you know. What he did was right. He was making the right kind of movie, and they, you know, saw that some of the footage that he was doing, and they were like, "This isn't Hellraiser. This doesn't feel like it. Feels like another type of film." And actually, I heard. I think he said it felt like a comedy. Oh, the way it was, oh, the direction it felt geez. like it was being shot. I mean, the, the way it looked, not right, that he wasn't right. Sure. Well, the way I, I the way can kind of see that because I think that there are some stuff, especially in the modern day shots. That's that. That's it, interesting. You say that. That's the. Uh, that's the stuff that's Kevin's. Oh, really? Yeah, and that yeah. that that stuff looks like it was shot for TV. That that exactly. That's what, that's what that's what Gary said. Wow. He said Gary says uh, Gary's uh, Gary said that uh, Kevin's footage felt very TV. Oh. As was, so that's why that stuff feels very TV yeah. is because yeah, you know. Uh, the, well, I mean, it Kevin sounds... came from the background of uh, Tales from the Crypt. Yeah. You know that was a TV, you know, yeah. you know, show for HBO. So yeah, but I mean, Gary's stuff sounds legit because I mean, Kevin Yeager had all those issues with uh, Sleepy Hollow when he was supposed to direct that, and Paramount ended up giving him the boot. Well, there's a whole story behind that, but I'll have to leave that off the record. Yeah. <laughs> Gary, Gary told me about that. I have to tell you about it. Okay. Yeah. I didn't like Sleepy Hollow. When I oh, saw, I, I like I like Sleepy yeah. Hollow. I was watching it I actually. Like the, it just, I actually watched the last week. It just to me felt like a big Tim Burton set with a bunch of actors that were just explaining the plot through through dialogue. It's, 
It's very visual over. It's yeah, very yeah. as a lot of Tim Burton film. Tim Burton and, films are. It's very visual style over substance. Yeah, and it's almost yeah. play like in a way, which yeah, I think exactly. is kind of fun. It, it, it felt like a Hammer film. Yeah, and I like that. See that kind of you know kind of film. Oh, like everybody's huddled together in a room explaining the plot to each other. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. how they you know they yep. do this type of film. <laughs> And I mean, it definitely is, you know, maybe it could have been a little darker, yeah. you know, or more taken a bit more seriously. But that's Tim Burton. You're going to get Tim Burton yeah. kind of it's a little yeah. twisted, you know, bits of humor like that. But I haven't seen it again since it first came out. What was that like? Ninety nine, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Ninety nine. Yeah. Huh. But I was going to say something else about those interviews. Oh, yeah. But he goes into uh, the last part goes into the. Uh, judgment, the making of judgment. So, if you're really kind of like interested on the that the that front, he talks about the script. How the, there was his original draft was more of a non-linear uh, approach to the story, which I thought was kind of interesting. And there's going to be a, a final part, the third. It's part three, part two of that. They they talked to the, they talked to Gary for like six hours. Oh, I could imagine. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that one podcast he did was like four hours long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but that was the only he, news we were getting about the movie at the time. So. Yeah. Yeah. So keep an eye on that. I'll you know po- I'll just I'll revise the post with uh, the because we had we already have a blog post about it on the yeah the I'm, main site. I'll just update it. I meant to ask you about that because you said there were three parts to your interview, and I went back and looked, and it seemed like it's just one post. So you must be adding on to the yeah, just updating. Oh, but. okay. Yeah. Um. Well, and then that that so that's really oh, and then and then he also had talked about on a on a. Was it a, a video interview? Birth movies, death. He had talked about his ideas for. Um, for I, a I think it was to originally. Judgment. I think it was originally on JoeBlow.com. Oh, okay. But yeah, he talked about his uh, his plans for you know if he was able to do a sequel. Oh, and oh, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't read this one yet. So. Yeah, and it was it, it was really interesting. It had to do with. Um, Pinheads being um, being exiled back to Earth, and and uh, there's a new a new um, a new hell priest that's taking over, that's doing a terrible job, and so the the auditor is trying to leave like a trail of clues to get for Pinhead to to come back to his old life and and uh, and take over again. Huh. Oh, that sounds interesting. That'd be cool if it was like a to do something like a. Like a Chenard kind of, you know, character. Yeah, that's what it, that was what I thought of when I read that too. Yeah. yeah. Although, although Chenard killed all the Cenobites super easily. Yeah. I, I still think <laughs> Chenard would have sucked as a if he would have ran hell. <laughs> I don't know. He just, I don't think he really. He he could teach classes on like one liners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Probably would have been some uh, interesting torture techniques he would have yeah. uh, invented though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my only concern with the uh, his thought there is that, uh, as as my friend Travis pointed out, um, is that it's uh, a little bit like the last couple seasons of The Office <laughs> when they tried to replace him and brought in other people and they were doing a terrible job and then everybody kind of gives him stuff to bring him back into the fold and. And maybe that's where he got the idea from, or something. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. <laughs> it does sound like a like a an office situation. Like yeah, a, yeah. You know, uh, and and I like, like the boss is really doing going... bad, and then everybody, you know, all the, you know, the workers are gonna, you know, protest or something like that. Yeah. We need the old boss back. Yeah. Yeah, and and I like that's the idea cool. of them going kind of toe to toe, but it also kind of makes me think of, um, uh, Freddy versus Jason. Oh. So hopefully it's not as. Uh... Well, hopefully, they would, hopefully they would use uh, chains and things like yeah. that to fight, and not you know their fists. Yeah. No kung fu fights between Cenobites, please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the, it's an interesting idea. It would, I think it would need a much higher budget than than the last yeah. two movies, probably put together. Yeah, I mean, you would think that if anything, at this point, if they're going to pursue with you know Gary doing one of these. They would have to give him more money just because of the positive response from the fan base. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, I mean, but that's if you he know really the studio had, still he exists. He really and, the, and those uh, 
that video interview, he really had to fight to get judgment made, though. They were really not, you know, keen on making it. Yeah. He had, you know, pitched another idea for another one, but he kind of felt it was like, it was called Hellraiser. I can't remember the, he dubbed it something, but. Yeah, he said he'd written a more generic script, and he said, yeah. you're, but you're not going to make this one, you're going to make this one, and he, and he you know, and, and I'll give you both scripts for the same price of just one. Yeah. But let me and, do you know, this one first. What what really shocks me with this is that you have somebody like uh, Jason Blum, who is kind of has like the freedom to do whatever he wants in the horror industry. He has his small little production company. They make, you know, these smaller budget horror films that, you know, I say smaller budget, but, you know, they're like anywhere from like three to five million dollars. Yeah. And they come out and they make, you know. Like a hundred million dollars, yeah, yeah, and because they're catering to the fan base, they know that yeah. people want these type of slashers, these yeah. types of ghost movies. Now they're doing the Halloween, they, right? Yeah, yeah, and so I don't understand why Dimension can sit back and not say, "Well, why don't we try to do our own Blumhouse? Like we've got this huge property. Let's yeah. put five million into it, make a really good movie, release it out there, and it's going to do great." Yeah, I don't get. The, I don't understand. You know the mentality. Well, and right? they were doing that for a long time. I mean, they weren't super great movies, but they had budgets, right? Yeah. The, you know, the, all the all the way five through nine, or eight, five through eight. I mean. Yeah. I mean, I just you know, I mean, they weren't huge. I mean, you know, like you said, they weren't huge, but two, three million dollars. I mean, just think of how much yeah. better you know. You know. Oh yeah. You know, they, they ju- look- judgment could have you know been with. That big of much more money, two, three million. They, they looked like real movies, and Hellraiser Nine was shocking. I mean, yeah, every, everybody thought, oh, it can't get any worse than than um, than Hellworld, and then we saw that it's like, oh yes, it can. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and you know the thing is so weird is I mean if they could have put just a couple million dollars into Gary's film, this could have been a huge thing that they could have released in theaters that would have made them you know profit back. Yeah. Do you, yeah. didn't have to, do you think it's not making a profit now? Well, I'm um, sure that I'm sure that it probably is because I mean Blu-ray well, sales has got to be pretty decent. Yeah. It only costs what three hundred fifty yeah. thousand yeah, dollars So, and it was on like Gary showed me it was like third in the horror sales on Amazon. Yeah, right but I mean, imagine the, the profit out. they could have gotten had they you know given it a good push, put it out there theatrically, oh, definitely. and not oh, yeah, spent I totally you know, more than ten million on, on it. Oh yeah, I mean I think that. They're not. They're not treating. I don't think they're treating the franchise right. I mean, I'm not a white yeah. judgment, but I still hold my my guns that they that the franchise needs to go somewhere else. I yeah, think, I, I, think I that totally. If, you know, if it was Pinhead tap dancing for ninety minutes, they you know at on that budget they would have made a profit, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to watch that. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see how it ends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Credits. <laughs> but yeah, um it, well and, and the, the, the the really interesting thing here now is like what's gonna happen? What direction is Hellraiser gonna go? I mean with the Weinstein company falling apart. I mean, is it over? Is are they done? I mean what I mean, are they Bankrupt. I mean, what are they doing to keep uh, their, I think, you know, just their name out there? Are they making any movies other than you know, Hellraiser? I mean, is that obviously going to give them some kind of money? But that's not going to be enough to keep a you know a company afloat. I mean, I just I don't. I'm curious where that are they well, going to fold they, into they, another? They, they probably lost a lot of money by by give, letting um, by letting Lionsgate do all of. Oh that. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> They might end know. up being bought out by Disney. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, just hopefully, uh, Jason Blum is offering them money to buy the franchise, or yeah, somebody I that, is. <laughs> I, you, who made a who made the on one of the podcasts? I think it might have been Marcus, or it might have been you, David, that said maybe do a sequel to a direct sequel, maybe to the second one. Is that what it was? Pick up from the second one and oh, just uh, yeah. Forget. And it, I think Jose was talking about how yeah. um, that's the new trend is to do soft reboots where you pick up from the. You yeah, where you kind of the, retcon. <laughs> yeah, you 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 bet you rewind back to the last movie that people really like, and then you go from there. 
But that, that's I mean, not, that's not really new. I mean, I think they even did that with the Highlander movies, right? I mean, they they're oh, like, yeah. they're yeah. like, oh, nobody liked Highlander two because that movie didn't make sense. So let's go on from the first one. <laughs> well, the first one should have just been one film. I mean, yeah, that, you know, I mean that was the whole point to the premise. The film is I mean, there could be only one, and he was the only one at the end. Yeah. But... <laughs> Yeah, it's like, well, if a movie's good, it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, I know. It, it, yeah. It's like, it's like Friday the 13th, too. I mean, how many times does he die? Not enough. I could watch those endlessly. Yeah, I know, man. I love those. <laughs> yeah. We got to get together sometime, David, and play that game. Yeah, we that do. That game's fun. Did you get, did you see all the stuff they added to it with, like, Roy Burns? And I haven't, because I haven't played it in, like, a couple of months. Yeah. Go in there and check it out sometime. It's pretty, they added the Pinehurst map. That yeah. map is huge. Isn't there one of those movies where Jason turns out to not be Jason? It's, like, one of the kids that was, uh, uh, that was, like, it was uh yeah, part, you're thinking of, you're thinking of the it's like uh the new beginning where part it, four they tried yeah where it wasn't jason part was five. really dead part and, five, and, and yeah. it was it was just yeah. like one of the kids of Imposter. the family that he killed or whatever that was pretending to be jason yeah it was it was the dad of one of the kids oh, that was yeah it was killed by one of the other like kids mental institution <laughs> yeah. camp and yeah tommy tommy jarvis goes to That's stay right. at it yeah, exactly. The, the guy was killed over a candy bar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, axed to death over it, too. I mean, not yeah. just God. killed. I mean, just chopped to pieces. But then at the end, like, Jason's grave got struck by lightning, and he came out He came out of the grave, I think. That was uh, part six. Yeah, the oh. beginning of part six, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've watched that's these a, movies pretty, too much. I've watched them too much. Can yeah. you imagine being the guy that wrote that? It's like... How do we bring Jason back? I mean, he's been dead for two movies now. I just, I, who cares? Just have lightning strike his grave. Yeah. When in doubt, lightning brings him back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if Frankenstein has taught us anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's actually uh, what that director actually was inspired by for part oh. six. I think it was Frankenstein to wow. yeah. bring Jason back for that one. <laughs> but what that might be a good episode title. Was it when in doubt, use lightning? Yeah, yep. that's, use that. Use that. that down. <laughs> use lightning. Okay. You know, the only time I think Pinhead was ever going to have any reaction with, uh, you know, Jason or Freddy was uh, for the Freddy Freddy versus Jason movie. The writers had written a an ending where Freddy and Jason were in hell and they're getting ready to fight, and these hooks kind of shoot out of the darkness and separate or kind of, you know block them from fighting each other and, and then he says like, like boys what seems to be the trouble or something <laughs> yeah it was pinhead oh. yeah i know <laughs> that's so cheesy yeah <laughs> so cringeworthy yeah, yeah right it's like you know somebody that doesn't really watch hellraiser movies wrote that yeah <laughs> yeah they were gonna do a michael myers versus a pinhead movie and always you know it was like uh, how bad could that have been, you know? I mean, I always pictured it being something like H2O over meets, like, Hellraiser 3, you know? And you know there was going to, I told I wrote, like, a, a a a feature on that. You know there would be some kid coming up to Pinhead. It would be set on Halloween. and be like, yeah. oh, that's an awesome costume, man. Where would you get it at? <laughs> yeah. you, know, you would know that. a kite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Right. Stoned out of his mind. Yeah. Yeah, and, like... So, Michael Myers is indestructible and doesn't really care about pain. So what, you know, how, what, how does that work? Yeah. It's like he gets chains it, into what him. What do you have to solve? The, he he have to solve the box? He, I mean, yeah. Right. I mean, have Michael <laughs> solve the box is just yeah. ridiculous in itself. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. somebody, the only way it could really work is if Michael followed them into the labyrinth or something like having one of the kids solve the box and then right. he just followed them into the, I'm imagining Michael Myers chained, you know, hanging with on the chains, and he's like looking at his watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he doesn't he doesn't scream or anything. Yeah. Occasionally, he'll grunt. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, th yeah, that that sounds terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So. In in feedback, uh, Juan Kiros asked the. Hopefully, I said your name right. Ask the podcast, do you know if if Clive will be there all three days at Texas Frightmare or only on Saturday? So, I mean, and, and Rob, you had brought this up and I saw it too, but 
I, I want people to be careful about this because I mean, yeah, it says on the on the website that he'll be there all three days, and maybe he's committed to that. But anything could happen between now and then, and it, yeah. could, it could be zero days. It could be only Saturday, um, or it could be all three. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I would go there. Anybody that's like, I saw one guy saying, I'm flying all the way up from Australia to see Clive Barker. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say make sure that there's other things that you want to do while you're there. Don't just don't just go there just to see Clive Barker. Because, you know, yeah, you know. if, if you've been to any other convention, you know that there's always cancellations and schedule conflicts like so and so signed on to another movie. So they've got to go film it yeah. or health reasons or any of that kind of stuff. You can't yeah. bank on them being there. Yes. Yeah. And and I've talked to some people that were only going to go there if Clive Barker was going to be there and like, Ryan, what do you think? And I was like, it, I would I would almost just suggest uh, treating it like a bonus if he's there. And yeah, that's what we're doing. I mean, we're, you know, our, our, our main focus is, you know, who are we going to talk to that's there? You know, Kevin Yeager's there. We've never talked to him before. Uh, Doug Bradley, we've, we, you know, I've met him, but we've never had him on the podcast. Um, oh yeah. That's what I was also going to mention. I don't know if it's <laughs> in that inter video interview or that interview with Gary T. Uh, I don't know if, it's a good thing to talk to Kevin about Hellraiser uh, Bloodline. Oh, really? <laughs> it sounds like if you ask him about him, he kind of, you know, just he won't. He's not very big on talking about it. So I'm not yeah. sure if that's something okay. we should. I'm just. Uh, well, maybe we could kind of warm him up through email or something to it. I don't know. Yeah. You know, if if we can. Say it's a, it's a bitter. It was it's a bitter pill for him. Yeah. And he still holds on to it. Well, and he's not, he's not there for that. I mean, he's not in the picture with the Cenobites and stuff. In, in yeah, he's there. He's there for the Chucky reunion. There's <laughs> yeah. A Chucky yeah. Reunion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I know he's going to get questions about it by other people. Yeah. I know. It's, it's gonna yeah, there, come there's up. a lot of Hellraiser fans that are going to be there. I mean, not just yeah. us. Yeah. I still, I, I want to try and see if we can. Oh, yeah. If we can. Oh, yeah, definitely. But, yeah. I mean, we we signed on for six interviews, you know, with our Kickstarter. So <laughs> we can, that would that would be a big help. Yes. Um, and and then Doug Bradley we haven't had on, and and then of course ah, there was this thing with Ashley Lawrence we should probably talk about too. Oh yeah. Yeah. So Ashley Lawrence went out to Twitter and said, "Hey guys, you know, I really wanted to go to." Um, to Texas Frightmare Weekend, but I wasn't invited. And she's like, you know, can you can you forward this and or you know retweet? And so we did. And and Rob, you made a, a blog post, I think, right? And um, and then the the people. Well, in Texas apparently it must have been like she must have. Well, the way I gathered from what we were sent an email by one yeah. of the Texas Frightmare people, and that they had discussed this with her before she wrote that tweet yeah. is what i gathered from it yeah and, yeah and it's like they're out of space and they're just trying to like okay for hellraiser yeah. we're just doing the cenobites and and they've, they've got a really like really concrete plan about who's coming and who's not because of space and limitations and stuff which is too bad i mean i i went to when i went there in 2011 she was there uh and yeah clive, and clive barker and doug bradley but not the other cenobites but I, yeah, I did a blog post and like, you know, said like, man, you know, you can see what the fans can do. Hopefully, maybe you know, yeah. you know, I didn't know that there were, had been any kind of prior discussions of like, we can't, you know, maybe yeah. what I gathered was that we can't, we just don't have, you know, we're, we're not doing this kind of, you know, it's not just a Hellraiser reunion on the side. It's called the yeah. a Cenobite reunion. Yeah. The yeah. Alley described it. And, 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 and uh, Ashley Lawrence. Really, I linked uh, like, really it, likes you know, to... go ahead. I was linking it to. You know to their Instagram, mm -hmm. the Facebook, and yeah. uh, what a Twitter. And I don't know, maybe they got lit up with a bunch of you know emails or something. And well, our, our Facebook had like 1200 uh views on it before we took it down, yeah, yeah. And and I think, well, and, and Ashley Lawrence, I think, especially wants to go if Clive Barker's gonna be there, 
Yeah. Um, she's really, really likes Clive Barker and really appreciates, you know, that he took a chance on her and, and you know, oh, yeah, started her career. And, and she, um, any chance that she gets to meet him, she usually takes. And I can see why, you know, she's really pushing to go. Oh, and, definitely. You know, and from my own personal experience, she has a super aggressive, like, publicist. So... <laughs> So if you're at her table, he'll be like, "Hey, how about what? We want to buy one of these. How about this? You want to buy one of these too?" Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I've never, I've never, I've never met her, so they, yeah. so it's. I don't know if he's if she still has that guy there, but he was. Uh, Russell had talked everybody else into giving me free, um, you know, free autographs because of Occupy Midian. Uh, but she, but Ashley Lawrence's publicist, publicist was like, no, we're not doing that. And, uh, and, uh, and then Claire Higgins pretended like she didn't hear that <laughs> already. So, which was a really awkward conversation for me. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I got like an autograph from each one of them, but I had huge stacks of things that I was getting signed by everybody. And then I get to them and it's kind of short stop. Like, well, I guess I'll pick this one. And, and then her Ashley Lawrence's publicist is like, well, how about this one? How about one of these? How about this? Oh, he's really trying to sell like, pictures, yeah, huh? Yeah, well, you know, it, and it was like Sunday. So he's like, how about if you buy this and this, then we'll do this one for free. And Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. But, yeah, on Sunday, a lot of people are gone, and they're starting to pack up and stuff. So, But, yeah, um, so maybe there might be a monetary, you know, that... I think people make a pretty good amount of money from one of these conventions. Like, you know, um, somebody had told me that um, Robert England will make a little clear like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in autographs at a, at a convention like this. I think Doug, Doug usually clears a lot, too. I imagine, you know? yeah. Yeah, he's he's pretty, he's right up there with, uh, with Freddie in terms of, I think, popularity and stuff. Yeah, at uh, Days of the Dead Chicago on Saturday... If you didn't get there early, you were in line for a long time. <laughs> oh, for for which person? For Doug Bradley. Really? Was he I doing like, the was he doing he the was, pinhead experience? No. Well, they had the uh, the photo booth and everything, but I mean, he was just treated like a rock star the entire time he was there. Oh, yeah. He also had the panel and everything. It was, I mean, it was cool to see you know him get treated like that. But you know, it's, I've never seen. I mean, it, like it was that. a long time. I, I've seen him um, maybe four or five times in conventions, and it's oh. always been like there's no line. You just walk up and talk to him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, see, I got lucky because uh, I was probably about um, three-quarters of the way through the long line that was lining up just before the convention opened. Mm -hmm. And then everyone stopped and was looking at all the stuff at the front. And so I just walked right past everyone and went straight to uh, his signing area. So I was like the oh, second person yeah. there. Oh, nice. But then by lunchtime, the line was even longer than that, you know, early morning entrance line was wow. just to see him get his autograph. So does it start yeah, at like four in the afternoon on Friday, Texas Frightmare? Yeah. I remember when I went to um, I, one of these conventions, I remember just kind of sitting in the hotel lobby and waiting until they would let me in. And then I'd made a beeline for and bought. This was the Mad Monster Party. And I made uh -huh. a beeline for Ann Bobby and Craig Sheffer, like, I'm going to beat the crowds. But they're, you know, they weren't really crowds. <laughs> <laughs> the time I met Doug was at a Dragon Con, and he was sit sitting next to, like, Kenny Baker and the Star Wars guys. It was like a, uh, like a British kind of, you know, you know, I guess, theme to that side of the, uh, I guess, side of the building where they were having. They, they, having they, uh, they segregated Dragon Con. I mean, I don't know. It just seemed like that because it had, you know, David Prowse there. Right. You know, uh, guy played. Uh, it just it was, it was all very British. Did Did you get mm -hmm. an autograph from David Prowse? Uh, no, my brother did. I I wanted to get uh Doug's. I just got Doug's, and I was yeah. there was only like two people in front of me. He didn't have a huge oh. line at all. Oh wow! And uh, so I mean, but that was like twenty years ago. So I mean the, the convention scene is those the convention scene's gotten really kinda of turned into like David's alignment. It's like really rock star, kinda of like you know, uh almost like concerts now. Wow. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I haven't been to one since Occupy Midian stuff. So like two thousand twelve, thirteen maybe is the last yeah. one. Yeah. 
Last time I went to one was in 2000. And I think, yeah, like 13. It was a nat. It was a nat. It was a uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Hmm. And it was a very small kind of con, but we got to meet some really cool people like Ernie Hudson and Sid oh, Haig wow. and uh, Derek Mears. Hmm. And uh, who else was it? Uh, the uh, Warlock, uh, Dick Warlock. He was really nice. Oh, I thought you were and, talking uh, about Julian Sands, the Warlock. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Try salt uh, water. <laughs> That's another good title for the yeah, right. podcast, too. <laughs> Try salt water. Yeah, but I um, can't write asshole in the title. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really curious. I mean, it's going to be, you know, seeing, you know, going to this thing, because this is going to be pretty big. This will probably be bigger than Dragon Con, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, so, it, it was big when I went to it. That was like 2011. And it's also really interesting to see, like, Texas culture. Yeah, like, I'm the, curious the, to see like that. Like, the way people like... cheer after movies, it's like, there's a lot of, like, hooping and hollering and... <laughs> well, I we'll have any kind of... them to, like, fire guns in the air. <laughs> I'm curious if they'll have a... If, you know, Blumhouse will have a, a booth or anything like a presentation about Halloween, the new Halloween... Oh, they may. I know cool. Shockwaves is going to be there, and that's their uh, podcast, so... Oh, there's a new also uh I just saw they're they're releasing a new uh Blu-ray set of Last House on the Left, Wes Craven's, you know, Last House on the Left. Oh yeah, the arrow like release. Three, yeah, that it's like got three versions of the film on it. <laughs> Jeez. I'm like, of wow. The, of the I mean, old one or the new one? The old, the old one. Oh wow. It's a it's a rough movie to watch, but I'm it I've is. always been kinda curious. It's a cur I've always been it's one of those films that I've always, you know, it's not something I like. I, I don't I, like. There's obviously parts yeah. of it that are really. I don't. You know, I don't. Really I don't like rape revenge movies. Yeah. It's, it's like yeah. a genre of horror. Like I spit on your grave. I, I don't. It's just uncomfortable and. I don't know. There's something about that movie though that, draw. I don't. I'm drawn to it. I think it's because, of uh, the era it was made. I like that. I like that kind of vibe. The '70s. Uh, yeah. You no. Know, kind of tone i don't know mm -hmm. yeah it's it's really disturbing there's oh getting a phone call uh okay, sorry films like you know taxi driver uh yeah right right where the characters look like regular people that are just screwed up yeah yeah they just the way they were shot they look like you know you're watching real people do these like yeah. you know, these horrible things yeah but I mean, I know that that movie was really chopped up. Uh, I think I, even like the theater. I mean, it was really controversial. I mean, I don't know if this is an urban legend or if it, you know if it's actually true. But you know, the theater owners would actually take the print and start cutting things out of the movie <laughs> themselves. Yeah, I, I bet. So oh, I, mean, I believe it. Yeah. Didn't she like um, for the the for the the dismembering scene with the you know the guys when she was pretending to, to go down on that guy and then she did the like cutting biting it off didn't mm -hmm. she, like she had they had taken a belt and cut it most of the way and so she was like chewing it and twisting and and to 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 rip it off i think that's that's pretty hard to watch yeah uh i, I know there's like a one of the girls that gets killed there's a disembowelling scene I, I think it was originally supposed to be a lot longer and they when were they kill like, her. and they were poking at her guts right yeah, yeah yeah that that originally i'm you know that was supposed to be much longer and i'm just curious if that was something the theaters had to really go at at that yeah. particular moment yeah yeah i don't know if i would want to ever watch that again i saw it one time and i think for me that's enough yeah, I was talking to David An David Anderson about that too, and we were both saying it's not something yeah you know, we can definitely watch. Even the remake, I yeah. I have a heart. I can't watch the remake all that much, even though the ending of that movie has an interesting ending where the guy's head gets put in the microwave <laughs> and what? just gets how blown do you, up. How do you do that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's you so over the right, top. It won't then. turn on when there's the door's not he, closed. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like his head like blows up. <laughs> it just, <laughs> I don't know. I guess it was a very kind of just. They said, "Well, screw." It. Uh, hopefully, they'll you know, they yeah, they'll, they'll buy into this since these guys are just horrible people. They treated yeah. these people horribly. They'll just right. buy into 
right? You could, kind of like, so kind of like Jaws, you know. I mean, because Jaws, come on, Jaws is one of my favorite movies, but a shark can't chew on a air tank. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> but you really don't care because you just want to see the shark, you know, dies, you know, die. Yeah, yeah. they had a Mythbusters on that uh, uh, episode based on Jaws. <laughs> yeah, there's no way that well, would happen. Well, and based on based on then I haven't seen that remake, but based on what you're saying, you could take a microwave and aim it like a gun. And shoot people with it, right? No, I don't. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I guess if you're going to, what they're using it as just a weapon of, you know, just yeah, just absurdity. Yeah. How they want to kill people. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> suspend disbelief. Yeah, yeah that's really uh, suspend disbelief is really what they were doing there. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, and we got one other uh, comment. Actually, it's a big long one on from YouTube. He said, since you requested at the end, I hesitated to write this, but I'm a new subscriber and haven't followed you since the beginning. So I have uh, no idea if all what I'm going going to suggest has already been done. I've become a hardcore fan of Barker relatively late, and I'm still making my way through his work. Anyway, let's throw this against the wall and see if something sticks. Political Barker. This will sound odd as nobody in particularly is particularly prone, me neither, to see Barker's work as politically or ideologically charged. <clears throat> Get back to that. But although he has been on the Bill Maher show during the 90s, there are books and that I wonder if could be seen as direct confrontation with the environment that surrounds him. I'm planning to read this year Cold Heart Canyon, and I wonder, having read reviews and descriptions of it, how uh, it fits the current climate in Hollywood and Weinstein-related scandals. Um... I've never read Cold Heart Canyon, so yeah. I, I can't comment on it, that. It's it's really um, at the heart of it. He, he was. It's really about like the corruption in Hollywood, and um, oh. I mean, there's even one passage in there where where he says like, you know, you can't get a script. If you get a script written, you, there's no guarantee that the person reading it won't be high on cocaine or have you know have their he said their dick in somebody's mouth or and uh, it is you know it is it is, it does really fit the current climate climate of. Hollywood. Mm. Wow, that's yeah. I mean, the the thing we'll be revisiting Cold Heart Canyon this year. But the thing that bugged me about that movie is it just or that book is that it just came off so angry, you know. And it's not like his other his other books in that way. It, it came you think off kind maybe of the angry, anger was a- angry and maybe, sarcastic. Maybe angry because of you know towards that kind of you know. You know the climate out there and how people don't want to be creative. Maybe I and how think, they just no. I think he was. I mean, I think personally he was going through some stuff. I think his father had just died, and uh, oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, and and his frustration with you know getting films made and the process of having to deal with you know yeah like, maybe that was what I was trying to get studio maybe get notes maybe. and their and their you know their dumb ideas and things and yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and people screwing with their with his yeah i mean i think that that's all that's a part of it too yeah well i might have to read that soon yeah because, well i mean, we, got it we'll be it's doing an episode one. on it this year so i mean i've not read there's a couple books i still haven't read it and that's gal galilee which you have a episode coming up coming up soon and, yeah and uh that so as far as political or ideologically charged um i think that Ide- he is def- his books are all ideologically charged i mean his mm-hmm. I- his his ideas about religion and and um sex yeah yeah it, it's it, it he's a, he's all about um transcendence and the the magic mm-hmm. of of um imagination yeah uh, but Politically, I mean, he used to post on on Twitter and Facebook all the time, and you'd get a really good sense of his political, you know, and ideological ideas. Uh, he doesn't anymore. I think that that he got tired of the you know the backlash, and uh, you know. Well, what was the one tweet, or was it a tweet or a post he made? And like, you know, when he coming out with a. Well, some guy wrote a comment oh, basically he, saying he was Stephen. He was Stephen King. Oh yeah, he said he said <laughs> r- write the sequel to Cujo. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and there was that, and there was like, he would write a big long story, um, explanation of something, some crazy thing that happened to him, and, and it's in all capitals, and people would say, oh, hey guys, Clive Barker got hacked. Don't read this. You know, Clive Barker is a, is, is a really good writer. Why would he write in all capitals? Wow, that's, that didn't see that's the time I yeah. was not yeah. you know, on and, social media and didn't see all that. And and around that time and we were warning people like, hey, if you do this kind of crap, he's gonna stop to, he's gonna stop talking to us. And, and that's what happened. And he did, yeah. And that's sad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean we all know Clive Barker is a good writer, but nobody ever claimed that he was a good typist. And there's a difference. Yeah. He writes his bi- his books by hand. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's not he's not technologically um, advanced. I mean, I think whatever he does is probably not on a computer. It's probably on his phone. Whatever he used to do on social media, you know, on Twitter, he would he would get on Twitter and say like, it would be like one in the morning, and he'd be like, "Hey, all my friends on the Twitter tree," and he would give a little update. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, and, and there were people he would talk about, um, he would, when he would talk about his life or, you know, his, 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 people would get up on there and go, oh, I didn't, you know, I just want you to write horror books. I don't want you to, you know, I don't want to hear all this gay stuff, you know? And mm-hmm. it's like, well, that's his life. And, mm-hmm. uh, why can't he, he could, he should be able to talk about whatever he wants on his page. And I, I had people, I, I wrote a, a story about that on our blog. It's you know the 10 things clive barker fans shouldn't do and yeah yeah that's <laughs> that's gotten a lot of responses to the did, blog, yeah. the the comment section on a that lo- a lot of angry people too i mean there were there are a lot of people saying like i think it's a great i think it's a great article though i think it spoke a lot of truth and they were like oh you can't censor me it's like well that's not i'm just telling you my opinion i'm not censoring i'm just saying it's a bad idea because he's gonna stop talking to us and yeah he, he did um, so yeah, Clive Barker can and has gotten political, but his, uh, his ideas are bigger than just like, you know, just like kind of an, you know, an anti-fascism, you know, story or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's, it has more to do with, um, you know, the human condition, I guess. Uh, he said, I think this would be an interesting topic, Clive Barker's faves. I don't know if Barker watches, reads a lot of horror stuff during every year, uh, but it would be nice to gather and comment on all his faves from now and before, both in film and literature, year by year, asking him at the end of the year about it. About this would be nice. Um, to that, I mean, I would say if you want to learn about his favorite stuff in horror, he's got Clive Barker's A to Z of horror. And mm-hmm. we did we did a long series about that, um, and that's a and it's a good book. I think you should go out and buy Clive Barker's A to Z of Horror. Um, what Clive Barker does a lot right now is he watches a lot of documentaries. You know, he watches nature documentaries. He watches a lot of documentaries about like World War Two and World War One. Oh yeah. Um, he watch he keeps up with movies too. I mean, he gets copies of, uh, he just having visited Seraphim, uh, the people that work at Seraphim make runs to, you know, and they buy like every comic book that there is and bring them up. I don't know if he reads all of that, but I think he, he reads a lot of comics. He That's cool that he, you know, still in the comic books and stuff. Cause I know the first comic book he bought was like Batman issue one or something like that. Oh, wow. Not issue one, but, uh. It was a Batman comic, so oh, really? I love I'd love to talk to Clive about Batman because that's my favorite, you know, comic book character. I knew he was into Marvel. I didn't know that. I didn't know that about Batman. Yeah, hmm. I was reading that about. Uh, well, I'm sure he is into Marvel too. I just remember him. Uh, what's that? Uh, the kind of biography book he did at the Dark Fantastic. Hmm. That's where I got that from so, i'm sure he loves marvel too he's just into comic books in general but i just that just struck it struck me because it just you know how much i love batman as well some of the things that um 
some of the things that he likes kind of creep into um, creep into the recent works. Like there was one time when Clive Barker had watched a documentary and there was a, a tree that had people hanging from it, um, like fruit, and he 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 um, and he was in sort of sort of inspired by that, and he said, "Hey, Mark." You know, I want this to get into the next Hellraiser comic. You know, when they were doing the Boom Hellraiser comic, so it did. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, there's a lot of little little things, you know, that he likes, and and um, but yeah, we don't. And and reading Phil and Sarah's interviews, sometimes you'll get little hints about the things that he's interested in, or the, or the things that he's doing, you know, or watching at the time. Um, and then his last thing, he said, unfinished business. Barker has mythologies that have no closure yet. But Barker has said that not giving closure is sometimes preferable. I don't remember that quote, but okay. And he says, so is a real necessity to write a third, the third book of the art and second book of Galilee? It's an interesting topic to discuss. That's all, folks. Greetings from Spain. So um, this is Raul is his name. Uh, Raul 3 on, on YouTube. But... Um, uh, unfinished. There's a lot of unfinished business. It's been really um, frustrating to the publishers because he starts out like saying, promising, okay, I'm going to do a sequel to the Great and Secret Show. I'm going to do a sequel to Cabal, and he'll have like a five year plan, and and then he just kind of whatever inspiration takes him, that's what he writes. Uh, so the sequel to Cabal never happened, um, you know. And I think, for the most part, people have kind of given up on that one. He said in interviews that he's not going to do it. Uh, the third book of the art, he's still working on. Um, uh, Galilee, he doesn't ta ever talk about. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Um, what else is there? The, uh, Aberat, he's working on. Aberat is tough. He... he um, He's really hard on himself with Aberat. He'll write a whole draft of a book and then throw it in the garbage, which is why it takes so long to for them to get done. Well, this new one, he got a lot of the paintings done. Hasn't he got a lot of them done? For yeah, this, uh... I think there's enough paintings for the whole rest of the series. Oh, okay. But, but I don't know. Um, yeah. No. Is there anything that you guys are, you know, hoping will come as far as, like, unfinished business? I'd like to see the third book of the art. Yeah. That's one of the big ones for me. Uh, like nothing from me. Uh, I mean, I just want him to work on whatever it is that he wants yeah. to work on. Because, how... I mean, you know, if you get – just because you get a conclusion doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good if the artist isn't that into doing it, you know? Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, and, and um, the Scarlet Gospels, I, mean, I don't know how much of that was done due to pressure from the fans. Yeah. Um, I, I really like the Scarlet Gospels, but a mm. lot of people complained about what could have been because it was yeah. such a huge, uh, it was such a huge book of notes and, and narrative. And um, it was, uh, it was edited down to, to something shorter. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's uh, what, but that's that's what that's I'd really like to see. Anybody ever asked him? It's like whenever he talk about anything. When's Scarlet Gospels coming out? You've been talking about that since like 1990 or whatever, and or not 90, yeah. like 98 or something like that. I'll tell you what, man. I would I would give one of my legs to just be able to have a copy of that book of notes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Well, and it, it, you can't make a book out of that because it's, yeah. it's got branching paths, you know. For... Yeah, it would, it would just be cool to see just to have, yeah. as a, have a copy as a document as a fan, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, they do that stuff with, you know, like Kerouac and other famous authors, yeah. you know, their kind of notes, journals and stuff. It'd be cool to have some stuff like that of Clive's work. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. I've seen it and I picked it up and I leafed through it, but I felt like I was doing something that I shouldn't. <laughs> and so it's like my mind was just b a blank. I don't, you know. Did your, did your heart start pounding? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I know it's real. And anybody out there that says that the that the hell that the Scarlet Gospels is ghost written, that's not accurate. I mean, it's yes, it was heavily edited, you know, <clears throat> for, but it's edited from material that Clive Barker already wrote. 
<coughs> yeah. Anyway, as far as unfinished business, I'm kind of more with you, David, because I think if you start if you start um, expecting things, then you'll just be disappointed. Yeah. <coughs> I like. Well, it's not I that I really go I'm along just, with. I don't. I don't expect the third book of the art to come out, but it yeah. just. No. Yeah, to, no. I asked if there was anything that you're kind of looking forward to, so that's different. Yeah. yeah. If that came out, you know. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, great, you know, if it's something <laughs> they made a big announcement. But yeah, whatever comes out, he has like. If he had like a new. New short story collection that just came out, he had yeah. been secretly been working on. I'd be like, oh, great, getting that. Yeah, you know? that would be awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That'd be cool if he just popped up with another kind of books of blood style, you know, you know, short story collection. Mm-hmm. You take what Sorry. you can get. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I mean, in like, he's writing Aberat, and there's a couple of years go by between like Aberat two and three, and then all of a sudden, Mister Begone comes out. Mm-hmm. Nobody expected that. He never talked about it or announced it. It's just all of a sudden it's here. And I really liked it. I mean, I, that was kind of the moment where I decided, okay, you know, just I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go with the flow. I'm not gonna sit there and hold out hope for Cabal Two, you know, and um, and just get mad every time a different book comes out than the one that I'm expecting, you know, or or, or with the Gar- Scarlet Gospels, you know. Is that you, what seems to be ha- happening with uh, some some fans? Is that I think a so. New book will come out. And I think that they're writing. Really I think that they've been writing the Scarlet Gospels in their mind, you know, for for years, and then when it came out and it's not the same as what they imagined, then they get upset. Imagine how much more they would have enjoyed it if he had never said anything about it and it was just released. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love, especially I love the, um, the, all the stuff with Lucifer and the unconsumed, you know, versus Pinhead. Yeah. Yeah. Everything in the, uh, I mean, I, I really love the book, but the second half of that, oh, I, I think it's fantastic. Oh, yeah. I love, uh, the death of Pinhead. I think it's kind of a classic monster death. Yeah. Somber. It's not like, you know, this huge, you know, epic, huge epic, you know, uh, uh, thing that I'm glad he kind of did it in a quiet way. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, <clears throat> on the site, uh, to, if you go over to ClydeBarkerCast.com, we've got some cool stuff up there. Uh, Rob, your interview with Gary Tunnicliffe that I guess you're, you're going to be updating that right to make it even longer. Um, that's That's got a lot of cool stuff in it. It was it was a neat surprise when you first posted that that you know you'd been talking with with Gary Tunnicliffe. Yeah, maybe in the future we can get him on the podcast. I think yeah. he'd be great to have him on to to talk with. Yeah, and um, and he had some nice things to say about our audio commentary. So if you go over to our audio commentary uh, for Hellraiser Judgment, and there'll be a link in the show notes here. But if you go to that, uh, we posted all of his comments in there, so um, so you can read his his response to that audio commentary. So um, yeah, so listen to that, and you can see his response to it. It's it, it, I think it's a really interesting movie, and it, it doesn't doesn't work for everybody, and that's okay. But um, it's a lot of people have listened to that commentary too. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a, been a lot of oh really views on yeah. that. Oh, on the on the um, on the YouTube. YouTube? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I did notice that. It's that that one's going up. And um, oh yeah, I meant to ask you, David. Do you you guys you guys have um, have like songs on your podcast, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so is that keeping you from being able to use the YouTube um, the the YouTube um, destination? Uh, it may. We've yeah. we've never posted our stuff on there, so. Oh, okay. <clears throat> we're yeah, I know you're we're pretty the, old school. You're on so. Libsyn now, <laughs> so they they've got all these they've got all these check boxes you can check for destinations, and you know, and then they just go to all those places. Yeah. So yeah, I we have a YouTube channel. We've just never really used it. I think other than to upload like one or two trailers or something. So that was a, a thing that Jose and I got into because I used to put songs on our podcasts. And he would mm. he would get mad and say, "Don't do that." You know, you're gonna <laughs> I, iTunes could take us down at any moment. You know, because we're violating copyright and 
Eventually, yeah. you know, eventually we ran into it where he was, you know, he was, he had started like making a YouTube channel and started putting the episodes on YouTube. He was like, hey, I can't do this one. And or he would discover I put a song at the end of another one after he'd already talked to me about yeah. it. And we're like, all right, fine. And we went back and re edited all the podcasts so they don't have those anymore. Yeah. And, uh, speaking of uh, Jose, did you, anybody of y'all listen to that like cool uh, playlist he did of uh, Rawhead Rex? I, had, I didn't. Music that was, a, I, that was I, really good. Is it? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I was thinking about songs. He created it. He created it through a set site. You can go and create oh, your own. Was like, it Spotify? Uh, Spotify. Yeah, yeah Spotify. Spotify. Uh, it's on the site. Give, so if you're, you know, into like really kind of Celtic kind of music and oh, yeah. weird, strange kind of you know music, and go give it a listen. It really fits the story. I think it'd be good music to listen to when uh, uh, you're reading it from the book of reading giving it a read uh, that's a good idea I can't listen to music while I'm reading because I can do I can listen to music or I can read but if but if I do if I if I do them at the same time then I find like I'm scanning the page and not really paying attention to what's on there and or I'm, and I'm listening to the music uh-huh yeah or I'm ignoring the music and it's not like and I'm not even, I don't know, then it's the same as not having it on, I guess. Well, it's not, I don't have a problem with it. If it's, most of this music is like, uh, orchestral yeah. type music. So there's yeah. no words to like distract me from what I'm reading. But usually if I, I can't listen with metal music or something like that. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> listen to Venom while I'm reading like, you know, yeah. a story or something. Yeah. Yeah, I can't do it. <laughs> But yeah, go check that out, guys. It's really good. Jose came yeah. up with a good release. Yeah, I, yeah. I keep meaning to. I got to get that added to my Spotify list. I don't. I never use those um, streaming. I always still just listen to CDs or like stuff. Yeah, me from too. iTunes. Yeah, it seems like Best Buy is gonna stop. Now they've getting they're getting rid of getting rid of uh, CDs. CDs now. Yeah. The last yeah. time I was at a Best Buy, their CD selection was horrible. Oh yeah, it's it getting looked, worse. It, it doesn't like surprise Walmart. me. Walmart, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure Walmart will probably probably follow and yeah, all that stuff's dying and it, it makes me sad. I like you know the I like the hard you know I guess Amazon yeah. places like online are going to be places that you know you yeah. get that stuff now. One time I was at a Walmart parking lot at the wall. We have one Walmart. We were, I was at the Walmart parking lot, and I saw this girl coming out of the store with a CD. And she unwrapped the, um, unwrapped it and threw the wrapper in the garbage. Then she took the CD out of its case and threw the case in the garbage. <laughs> okay. It, yeah, it's like it, like it was just cellophane or something. It, I think that people younger than us have a different um, idea about collect about music and collecting and yeah know, like, she she probably took it home ripped the cd and then threw the cd in the trash so. yeah i think so too it's like but you just paid for all that i mean <laughs> but cds are cheap now they're all like 10 bucks right pretty much yeah they used to be yeah, I, could... I remember when they were 25 when they came out in the late 80s oh yeah yeah i remember that yeah, yeah. Those big ass cases that came yeah. in. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the long boxes. <laughs> yeah, the long boxes. I took. All, I still I, have some of those of uh, my Queen CDs. Oh, oh nice. I oh, took that's all cool. of my Slayer long boxes and and I made um, in a marketing class. I made a brochure about uh, about going to hell for vacation. <laughs> so like I took the Hello Waits the the Hello Waits long box and cut it all up and and made like made a brochure out of it. Oh <laughs> sweet! You still have that? I'd like to see it. No, it was like um, it, it it was like spend hours of fun in the sun with friendly natives, and <laughs> <laughs> I got a D on that. <laughs> you were always getting kind of like picked yeah. on by your teachers because you're actually doing things that were a little, yeah. I guess, not. Yeah. No, not. <laughs> I guess considered part of the norm, and I would have loved that stuff. We would have been great friends in class. Yeah. <laughs> my my teacher was the marketing teacher was like, "Oh, great, Ryan, nice, oh, yeah, tell everybody me to that. go to hell." <laughs> That's not getting the joke, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, I think I was just trying to, you know. 
have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> it's and more it, it, using it, your imagination. And marketing is harder when it, when you're marketing something that's terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, so yeah, there's Jose's Spotify playlist for Rawhead Rex. Uh, your Hellraiser Judgment review is up um, on the website. So read that if... There's a lot of people that have been on the fence. I mean, this more than any any movie I've seen in a long time has a lot of people saying, hey, guys, should I watch Hellraiser Judgment? And then you get a mix of some people saying it's the worst Hellraiser movie ever made, and then some people saying, yeah, you should watch it. It's good. And I like that kind of diversity. Yeah. I think it's kind of cool to see that. Yeah, as long as they're not judging people for you know liking it. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. what the, the, the bullying, <laughs> the, the bullying of uh, opinions is what you're talking about. Yes, like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, bullying if, their if, opinions. If you like it, people. you must be stupid or you must. Yeah. Yeah. My opinion matters and that's it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right. It's all about but me. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, though, I, I really did not like judgment, but I've watched it four times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a trooper. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean. Uh, I mean, the more you see it, the more you start to like it and you can kind of get past, you know, whatever your hang up is for it. Because some people yeah. it's the acting or this or that or whatever. But the one um, that, the one that ju- mystifies me is that it's a rip off of Saw because I yeah. mean, I but I can't comment on that because I've never seen Saw. Not all the way through. I've seen parts of it and then I left the room. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, you know, like I've I've gotten over a lot of my hangups, and after the fourth watch, I'm kind of like, yeah, yeah, I kind of <laughs> like <Yeah>. it now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've watched it like a, you know, at close to ten times. So wow. I mean, I'm, there's something about it that I like definitely. Yeah. I, I mean, clearly there must times. be something to like if we keep revisiting it. You know, yeah. especially if I didn't like it yet, I still keep going back and rewatching it. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I can no longer keep saying that I don't like it because I keep watching. Well, and, and even if you don't like it, there's some really sort of weird, intriguing stuff in there that is not it's not formulaic and, and you know, yeah. in a in a stupid way, like Hellraiser 8 had a lot of really, you know, tropey kind of, you know, killing teenagers kind of stuff in it. Yeah, yeah Gary really talks about how much he hates that movie in yeah. his interview. Hey, you thought that was the end of the franchise right there. The, well, and, and, and I had only seen it once when we then we talked about it for the podcast and, and uh, we did it. We did both an inter- episode and an audio commentary. Yeah, and that was more, one of the worst ones. The I mean, more the you commentaries. watch that, the less it makes sense. Right. Because there, yeah, it doesn't make any kind of sense. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that on rewatch like, wait a minute, you know, this is supposed to, all supposed to be a, a drug hallucination. So why are they seeing stuff that's from somebody else's perspective? Or yeah, you know, just... see there's scenes where they weren't in the they weren't there and and like a ghost called the police, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't remember, man. I mean, yeah. it's like I said, that films <laughs> kind of you know. I just, the only thing about remember that movie is Doug holding like a meat cleaver and cut somebody's head off, and it just yeah. was like that, that's Jose's most hated part of it. Yeah, yeah, I know that's the part where I'm like, and that's like never you forget turned... that Superman was in it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He weighs about a buck oh five, and yeah, right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I have not watched Superman versus Batman or the um, Justice. What is that called? The new one, the the Super Friends movie. Justice, uh, Justice League. Justice League. Yeah. I like the I like both of them. I enjoy those. Uh, give them a chance if you you know see them yeah. on TV or something like that. Yeah. I had somebody oh somebody told me Superman died and I was like, "Well, I guess I don't need to see that anymore." Oh, that sucks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the same God. thing happened with the with the um with the new You got to be careful. The be Logan careful going... movie too that happened. Oh, that sucks. Oh. Jeez, well, you gotta be careful going on YouTube too, because people will like film, you know, film scenes in the movies, mm. oh, actually, yeah. in actual theaters, and then they'll yeah. post it on YouTube and they'll, you know, name it, you know, like in Planet of the Apes, you know, I, the newest, newest War Planet of the Apes, the guy yeah. Caesar. Have y'all seen that one? Uh, no, yes. I want to. Yeah. Well, okay, well, I'm I not, I'm not saying nothing. The, then. That's a whole trilogy now, right? Yeah. yeah, and I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna, say, I'm not gonna ruin anything. One, I think, yeah, 
But just be careful going on YouTube. The point is, is that people will spoil things in videos. Yeah. Well, just Facebook go on YouTube is even just... worse because they, they, they do that when you, you know, when you write something really short and it's got the big print and the flowery background or whatever, you can't just scroll past that. I mean, if you could, if you've got more than like a third grade reading level, you're reading it as you're scrolling past. <laughs> yeah. So that's where I get split. It reminds me when I was a teacher, I had kids writing journal entries, right? And, you know, I would just, their grades were based on how many pages they would write. And I told them, I'm not going to read your journals. So I'm scrolling through counting pages on this one person's and I saw Ryan is a asshole. Like, and it took up the whole page. <laughs> and and so I, I confronted them about it and they said, you promised you weren't going to read these journals and you just read that. And I'm like, how can you not read that? <laughs> God. Wow. There's another possible episode title. <laughs> See, you got a lot out of this one. <laughs> Actually, uh, I'm, I'm Facebook friends with her now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. But, um, gosh, man, um, where were we at? <laughs> For uh, the forbidden, the forbidden oh. audio commentary now. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we did an audio commentary for both Salome and the forbidden. Um, and that kind of leads into our general Kickstarter update. So um, I shipped out, Jose and I both shipped out all of the stuff around February 7th, around that week. I mean, I yeah, there was so much stuff that I, you know, just couldn't, I didn't have the wheelbarrow to, to take it all to the post office at one time. Um, so it was over the course of three days that I shipped everything out. Uh, I made one mistake because somebody bought multiple things and I didn't, I didn't get their last thing in the, in there. So I'm going to be shipping that out here really soon. Um, we did an episode on Sacrament. Uh, we did the Hellraiser Judgment audio commentary. We did an episode on the Magician. We did Salome and the Forbidden audio commentaries. Uh, we did an episode about Clive Barker, the Art of Horror. So we're kind of really moving along through our our uh, goals. And um, w the iOS and Android app. I wanted to talk about that really quick. Have either of you guys downloaded those? Yep, I use the on. Android app. Oh, okay. And yeah, I've, the, got, it, I've got the app, yeah, but... Is the Android updates? app updated now to where you can do comments? Because I, I know it is on the iPhone, but I, I don't have any Android stuff. Let me see. Um, I have not checked it yet. Oh, okay. It should be uh, 258 <laughs> is the new version. Gotcha. And when it, when it does the update, it just says, like, um, all it says is, like, um, bug fixes. But that's not true. It's got a whole bunch of new features. One of them was really shocking. I, I saw a phone, a little f picture of a phone, and so I tapped on it, and it's like, call this number, and it was like my personal cell phone. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's like, okay, I guess. Uh, it shows uh, 236 for me. Oh, yeah, that's the old one. So the Android one's not done yet then. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll talk to them about it. Obviously, I'm not coding this myself. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> there's a... Uh, um, there's developers that work for um, Libsyn that that yeah. do the app, and they um, they do the the updates based on you know how many downloads you get. So if you've got a smartphone out there, you know please go and it's free. Download the iOS and Android app, and particularly if you don't regularly listen to podcasts, uh, then you know and you don't use podcast aggregator apps and stuff, maybe get the app and try it that way. Yeah. And that's kind of where we're at with the Kickstarter. Um, coming up next, we will be talking about Hellraiser the Toll. I'm trying to work out with Mark Miller, the author, uh, when he can join us for the podcast. So I talked to him a little bit in email, but it, it's, you know, he sometimes it's like three or four days between emails. So it's a little bit slow. Um, but uh, we're working on that, and um, we can grill him a little bit about clive barker at texas frightmare weekend maybe and what else is going on with at seraphim i'd like to ask him if uh, the heroes of the tolls the uh, start of a new series of books that yeah. might involve uh uh harry to Moore and kirsty kind of the way oh yeah. uh, right because it's, it's set up as a prequel to the scarlet gospels mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it would be awesome yeah um 
Sleepwalkers will probably be doing an audio commentary on that one pretty soon. Uh, originally, I was thinking we would be doing Barn of the Blood Llama, but that movie is so hard to get a hold of that we, you know, we're going to push that back a little bit. Uh, we'll have news episodes. The Duels of Blood are going to be coming back really soon. So actually, I wanted to talk to you about that. If you're out there, um, I started a list of... It's going to be all Hellraiser this time. So Hellraiser characters and Cenobites and stuff like that. So um, and I, I added the... He asked me to add the added the uh, Stygian Inquisition to the oh, list. Yeah. There. Oh, I see them. Yep, you got uh, Stitch nice. and the Auditor, the Assessor, the Jury, the Butcher, and the Surgeon. Yes. So. Cool. That'd be cool. Yeah, and there's another Cenobite called the Surgeon, right? That's completely different from other sequel Hellraiser sequels, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. A yeah. One. yeah. You talk about the one from Part Six. Yeah. 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 The one Hellseeker. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we could put the Surgeon parentheses like Hellraiser um, Judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or eleven or ten, I guess it would be. Yeah, just put ten. And, okay. And, um, yeah, so we're looking... We, we need 64 Hellraiser characters. So um, there's lots to choose from. We can go through the, from the movies and from the, um, and, uh, from the, the comic books. So, um, yeah, let's, let's see how many we can get on here. And we'll kind of mix them all up and put them against each other and do a new Duels of Blood. Um, I think our last one was just a little bit too, um, too niche. You know, with all the book characters. So this time we're going, uh, we're going for the Hellraiser and Clive Barker fans. So I think it should be a little more exciting. And um, so who that's the, the, who who won it last year? Uh, it was weird. It was a weird kind. Yeah, of... Yeah, it was. Um, oh gosh, what is his name? He's the the bad guy with one foot from Aberat. Um, I haven't. I don't he's know. Got, he's got sword just... sheaths built into his back. Oh, that's a uh, that guy from the first book that was chasing. Uh, yes. Why? Well, I don't know girl. why my mind is blanking on his name. Mendelssohn Shape. It's Mendelssohn yeah, Shape. Yeah, Mendelssohn Shape. Which was really weird. Um, he he uh, his the final round was him against Mahogany, and he just completely obliterated Mahogany for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I think, <clears throat> and then, felt like... and then we, and then we put him against last year's winner, which was Julia Cotton, and he got ninety five percent of the votes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think, what really what happened is there's a Mendelssohn shape like super fan that that was clicking vote like every five minutes to make this happen. Yeah, jeez. <laughs> 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 kind of sounds like that story when they wanted to kill off Robin, you know, in the old uh, uh, Death in the Family comic. A lot of people said one guy was, uh, if you call in, if you want Robin to die, you call this number. And some people feel like somebody was just calling. The, it was the same guy calling over and over <laughs> to have him die. Jason Todd, the Jason Todd version. Because oh, wow. a lot of people didn't like him. That <laughs> So he got uh -huh. he got killed based off, you know, like a phone call. If he just made the DC. Wow. Yeah. So was he really dead for good in the series then? Well, up until uh, they came back with, I think, Hush. Yeah, when uh, yeah. Jim Lee came back. Yeah. Jim he Lee came back as Lowe, a... Right? Yeah, exactly. Which was a really good series. Yeah, it was, like it was tremendous. I don't yes. think I've ever even read one Batman comic. The only Batman comic uh, experience I have is those that those memes where Batman is slapping Robin. <laughs> You need to read uh, The Dark Knight Returns by yeah. Frank Miller. Yeah. You need to at least read that. Yeah, you that's, like that's that a one. classic. And uh, um, The Long Year Halloween. One. Yeah, Long Halloween. Dark Victory's good. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good stuff out there with Batman in it. Yeah. But there's a lot of crap Batman comics, too. So yeah. <laughs> Anything that has that many issues is going to have some junk. <laughs> yeah, there's a ton of junk. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, and then 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 after that, I mean, we'll be doing duels of blood and probably pairing that with episodes about the Clive, the Hellraiser comics, which I, pro I don't think I have them all. So I'm going to have to start, you know, filling in the gaps, the Marvel epic Hellraiser comics. I mean, I have all the Boom Studios ones. 
Yeah, I don't have any of those, so I might have to pass on those episodes. Okay. Yeah, and um, so yeah, we'll be we'll be working on that. Um, That's what's coming up in the future, and then uh, and then of course Texas Frightmare Weekend, and we're going to be working on uh, working on the book, the the interview book. Is there a program where you can like? uh, I was going to ask, like, I'd be willing to invest into it myself. Where you can take podcasts and have them transcripted. I bet that could make it the process go a lot I think, faster. I think there probably is, but I would be afraid of that. I would miss, you know. I, don't well, know. I wouldn't. I'm, yeah, you have wanna, to go you know, back and edit. Yeah, with you it. definitely go back yeah. and you know just. Yeah. But then I mean, if you go back, but just and to edit, have like a rough, a rough version still, of it. If you go back and edit, you're still listening to it while you do that. Yeah, so it's kind of pointless. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that maybe it would save time. I I'm not sure. I don't know if it's pointless, but. I was just thinking. I think it would yeah. save time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's worth a shot if we have something that can do that. Yeah, we'll have to do some research. Yeah. yeah. All right, and this podcast having mm-hmm. no beginning will have no end. Find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.cliveparkercast.com where we have news and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and every other place you can find podcasts. The Clive Barker Podcast is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Sarah Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.